world. Hello, 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 everyone. Hello, hello, hello. Happy Friday, everyone. I hope you're doing well. It's Friday. Are we going to start singing Rebecca Black's song again? I can't believe how old that song is now. It is Friday. I'm sorry I'm a few minutes late. It's just the way it is. I'm trying to get uh, the Twist podcast edited and all the things out to the world. But, you know, we can only do what we can do with our time and our energy. And I'm really glad to be here to talk, not talk, to read it's story time again, everyone. That's right. What does that mean? Hi, Stella. Stella's back. It means Stella's back to fall off the chair. <laughs> Hi, sweetheart. This is Stella, and she loves the attention and shedding everywhere because it's springtime. Um, but I'm reading from my grandfather's books. His name was Tro Harper, and he wrote a bunch of books about San Francisco, having lived there for many decades as a bookseller. He had a lot of stories of places and people, and he had them published, wrote them down and had them published, but not very widely, and I think they're great stories, so I'm trying to share them with the world a little further. Hi. You going to listen to Stella? Are you ready for story time? So we were we are on to a chapter, a little subchapter called It's a Trip. And there's you can see there's the there's the art boat trip like on a ship. <laughs> the book is called Nowhere Except San Francisco: Memoirs of a Resident Tourist. And if you hear a sound of rushing or a hiss in the background, that's a hose that is going in the backyard that I have no control over. So I apologize for that background noise if it is a little loud. It's a trip. In his famous book, Two Years Before the Mast, Richard Henry Dana describes the Bay of San Francisco in 1834 as waters lapping lonely shores. Again in 1859, he sails through the Golden Gate to see a San Francisco, quote, with its storehouses, towers, and steeples, its courthouses, theaters, and hospitals, its daily journals, its well-filled professions, its fortresses and lighthouses, its wharves and harbor with their thousand-ton clipper ships, more in number than London or Liverpool sheltered that day. He goes on to describe a beautiful town on the fertile wooded shores of Contra Costa, across from San Francisco, and capacious freighters and passenger carriers to all parts of the Great Bay and its tributaries. He says, I can scarcely keep hold on reality at all. Scarcely! Okay, moving on. We are now on to It Takes Compassion and Humility. And doesn't it, though? Of all the sights and sounds to enchant visitors to San Francisco, there is none more breathtaking than the outdoor flower stands. Yes, right there on the street corners in the path of thousands of pedestrians are banks of dahlias, Peruvian lilies, zinnias, marigolds, and of course, carnations, roses, daisies, and the gladioli. Although City Hall allots only 12 thin spaces on the curbside of the downtown sidewalks to the vendors, these urban oases are scattered so evenly through the shopping areas, you feel there is a lot more. Once upon a time, say back in the 1920s, there were as many as 160 peddlers hawking flowers. But what with one thing and another, like depressions, wars, city restrictions, weather, and the unattractiveness of doing business in the open air, especially exposed to the cooling blasts of that, that sweep in from the Pacific Ocean, there are only four families left to carry on the tradition. Among these are Albert Nalbandian and his brother, and it is with Albert that I still maintain a friendly relationship. Albert, inveterate book collector that he is, used to spend a lot of time in my shop, occasionally discovering a treasured volume of some sort, and I, it was through these casual contacts I got to know him and appreciate him and the peculiar trade which afforded him 
not only a living, but the freedom to live his life as various spirits move him. Not only that, but as I listened to him and his tales of life on the streets of San Francisco, I realized I was talking with one of the last of his kind. Hello, Irma from the Philippines. Great to see you. Oh, I'm going to grab my coffee before it goes cold. Albert Nalbandian is a dour and wiry little man who not only sells flowers, he acts in movies and TV shows and has some 50 pictures to his credit. His collection of books and paintings by Armenian authors and artists is not only unexpected, but rare indeed. He explains his peculiar dichotomy of interests by saying, I'm the only character I know who gets paid for being a character, both on screen and off. And besides, industry has to support art. His habit of looking skyward, rolling his eyes and smiling as he says this, leads me to believe that he is well aware of his ability to do all he tries and that it is not unconscious. On a trip to downtown San Francisco one recent morning, I paused at his stand at the corner of Geary and Stockton Streets just outside the building that until recently housed the elegant I. Magnon store to chat with him. He plucked at my coat sleeve and said, You know what you need? No, what? It's kind of like how my grandfather would say it aloud, what? An elegant carnation, something to set off your lapel. He reached into a sheaf of flowers piled on his work counter and snapped off a small pink carnation. As he fussed with pinning the flower to my lapel, I said, Sorry, I don't have a proper buttonhole. Me too, but then they don't make buttonholes on lapels anymore. Whatever happened to class? When A.P. Giannini ran the Bank of America from his offices at the foot of Powell Street, he always stopped and let my father pin a carnation on him. Just like this one. As I walked away, feeling quite dapper, I began to muse on the matter. It's true. Very few, in fact, almost no one, indulges the elegant touch. The delicate nicety that sets the person of substance and spirit apart from the slobs. The grunge factor has become a badge of distinction, with small children trying to emulate the odd creatures who inhabited Powell Street during the era of the flower children. Or they seek to imitate the creepy participants on various afternoon TV talk shows. Anyone with eyes or a nose can plainly comprehend that spring blossoms and grunge are not of the same universe. In the flower business, as practiced on the streets of San Francisco, Albert is well known as is as well known as was Dick Gump when he was running the famous Gump's store on Post Street. Although not to the same clientele. Nor does his sidewalk flower stand equal the volume of business done, nor have the elegance of Podesta and Baldacci, the nationally known purveyor of floral nice finery. Albert figures, however, he brings a special aura to the streets of San Francisco, since his stand not only brightens an otherwise dreary cityscape with color, but also injects fragrance into the crisp air that sweeps in from the Pacific Ocean. Hi, hi, everyone! Yes, I'm not a medical doctor. I am a PhD neuroscientist, but I'm reading about San Francisco from my grandfather's books right now. All right. I'm missing a word there. Oh, no. Anyway, Albert Nelbundian's family began selling flowers in 1905 at Post and Grant, but the key word in the argument is continuously. With the Powell Street cable car turnaround just behind the original stand and the day and night bank right in front of it, the Powell and Market intersection jumps with foot traffic from early morning until late at night. For years, Albert and his brother spelled each other tending this stand, but about 50 years ago, Albert learned the space on the corner outside the I. Magnon store at Geary and Stockton Streets was available. It was, it was and still is a location that swarms with an upscale class of citizens on their way to either Macy's, I. Magnin's, or Neiman Marcus on an opposite corner. 
Over the years, Albert has gotten used to the hubbub of the passers-by, as Albert tenderly nurses his blossoms, arranging a bouquet, making a sail, or emptying a bucket of stale water into the gutter. Shoppers elbow and shove to get through the pack. Shout at one another, either out of friendship or annoyance. Lift their shopping bags above their heads to keep them from being torn apart. Nowadays, Albert works only in the morning hours. Afternoons, he takes off for home and leaves the floral chores to others. The hirelings used to be elderly and retired Armenians, but today, Albert says all the elderly retired Armenians have disappeared. He likes the idea of selling flowers so much so that while many passers-by consider flower retailing on the streets a non-intellectual, non-creative, and non-broadening pursuit, Albert takes the opposite view. The more I am able to study humankind in the raw, so to speak, the better I am able to understand the characters I play in the movies. And where can I find a job that gives me so much freedom, that lets me indulge my hobbies, and still provides a... A reasonable living. Also, there aren't many businesses outside of fashion retailing and Christmas and Easter stuff where the inventory changes with the seasons. But, and it's a big but, there are drawbacks. You have to anchor yourself out in the cold and fog to keep the wind from lifting you into the stratosphere. On cold days, you shiver until you're numb. And on hot days, when we have any, the flowers wilt. And they are unsaleable. Some guy asked me the other day when I planned to retire, and I asked him... Retire to what? Albert's father started the business just after he arrived in San Francisco, fleeing the Turkish, per Turkish, persecution, Turkish persecution in his homeland. The way Albert tells it, his father had no skill except as a farrier, spoke little English, and wrote none. In fact, the initial part of his name, Nalband, means horseshoer in Turkish. The Ian at the end means of the family. Like most immigrants, he took what work he could find. After his arrival in America, he began his new adventure as a polisher in a wire mill somewhere in the Middle West. It was dangerous, tedious work, and so when a friend suggested that they go to California, he managed to borrow some money for a ticket and rattled across the continent to the Golden State. Once he reached San Francisco and discovered he was in the coolest spot in America, especially during the month of August, he decided to stay. Somehow, he got together with two of his countrymen, also newly arrived, and together they set up a stand to sell flowers. They knocked a few boxes together, bought some pails for water, nailed up a sign that said, Paul's Flowers, and were in business. There is, there are publishing issues with this book. <laughs> Uh, something of day, any time of day with Albert at the stand at the foot of Powell Street on my way to and from the bank, a constant, constant stream of people greeted him or his brother as Paul. Albert's father met his mother by riding home to the old country, a custom among early immigrants from Armenia, inviting available picture brides to come to America and be wives. Over the years, she bore him three children who grew up in a very traditional American way, to be citizens who are not only self-sufficient, but have also enlarged the meaning of the American dream. With no social security, no health care, and no social net, the Nalbandians prospered, bought a house, educated their children, obeyed the laws of the land, and got along with their neighbors. As Albert's, Albert's father grew into the San Francisco scene, his circle of friends enlarged from the Armenian colony to include many civic dignitaries. Quite naturally, since his stand graced the steps of the Bank of America building, A.P. Giannini, the founder, and his brother became daily customers at a time when buttonhole carnations were considered a necessary part of a business attire. The longtime mayor of the town, Sonny Jim Rolfe, was not only a customer but also a crony, and the two men spent many extended, visitors, extended visits together enshrouded in cigar smoke. When Albert's father began selling flowers, Powell Street was the nightlife center of San Francisco. The Tecau, ta the Tecau Tavern was in what is now the basement area of the Bank of America building at the foot of Powell and Market. Bars and banos were about equally spaced up the Powell Street Hill until you got to the St. Francis Hotel, where the tone changed abruptly from raffish to refined. You want me to read the comments? Yeah, 
Mm-hmm. Hello. Like to see you. Aha. Thank you for joining me for story time. This book, Nowhere Except San Francisco, written by my grandfather. I'm reading stories from San Francisco. Thanks for joining. The Tecau Tavern was one of the most frequented bars and restaurants in town. Rudolph Valentino was a waiter there, the same Valentino who later became the most celebrated of all movie... Uh, uh, all movie actors of the 20s. Albert thinks he remembers Valentino, but he's not sure now whether he remembers him or his remembering what his father told him about him. His father reported Valentino was always dancing and flirting with the ladies who came to the tavern, charming all who looked his way. Albert is where, well aware of the glaring disparity between his educational background and his mode of employment. As a graduate of the University of San Francisco and a collector of books and art, he is nevertheless at a loss to find a more satisfactory way of earning his daily bread. He denies he makes any money, but the flower business, plus his movie acting, give him free time, a commodity he values more than money. Since Albert has worked in a flower stand, ever since he can remember, he is not bothered by the fact that some of his friends consider his occupation menial. There is no such thing as a menial job, only menial people, he says. Working with one's hands will never be menial. When and if he talks about the education that has been afforded him and his family, he invariably harks back to his sister Louise. He is immensely proud of her. At the age of 21, she became the youngest person ever awarded a Ph.D. degree from Stanford University. After Stanford, Louise became a lecturer in Armenian language and history at the University of California in Los Angeles and at Fresno State University. Later, she wrote a book on Armenian history. Although Albert has been a sidewalk flower vendor for 50 years or more, he knows little about the overall history of the flower stands, which adds such unique flavor to San Francisco. He is aware that the first flower stands were installed in the 1880s when Michael DeYoung built the DeYoung Building at the corner of Market, Geary, and Kearney Streets. Michael DeYoung allowed the vendors, who were mostly of Italian, Greek, Belgian, Irish, or Armenian descent, to sell their flowers in front of the building and also protected them from the police, who at first were intent on driving them off the streets. The first flower stands in San Francisco were not stands at all, but consisted essentially of wicker baskets carried from place to place and were introduced to the streets about 1875. The sellers used to gather violets out along what is now Van Ness Avenue and sell them for a nickel a bunch. Many of these catches catch can stands operated mostly along Kearney Street, then the main thoroughfare to the Barbary Coast, where men who were on their way to see the girls in the dance halls and the cribs along Pacific Street could buy bunches of flowers. The men would swarm off the ships tied up near the foot of Market Street, stop to buy some violets or whatever else was in season, and proceed to the entertainment. While Albert is not a stickler for dates or other such bothers, he read in the San Francisco City Guide, published by out-of-work writers during the Great Depression, that the first stands were licensed by the city in 1904. Before that date, they were considered illegal and were in constant conflict with the conventional florists. The conventional florists complained to City Hall that the unfair competition of the street vendors was ruining them, but the sidewalk operators countered that the housewives wouldn't buy any flowers at all if they had to step into a snooty shop and pay the high prices dictated by the high downtown rents. Besides, said the sidewalk merchants, we are real life, living color ads for the entire floral industry and certainly beautify the drab streets. Finally, the undeclared war ended when the conventional florists gave up as downtown rents forced them into the outer neighborhoods. Most were glad to leave, however, since over the years the downtown area had become no place for flower shops. Panhandlers, street people, plus assorted, hu assorted human flotsam made it difficult to conduct a legitimate store of any sort. Ask me. I was running a bookshop. Conceivably, the flower stand, as it is known on the streets of San Francisco today, may go the way of the buggy whip as a young person can make a living without standing on a cold street keeping a weather eye out for trouble, which more and more seems to leap out of the ground. In the old days, 
When the flower market opened at 5 a.m., vendors had to be Johnny at the rat hole or they didn't get anything but leftovers. Nowadays, the wholesalers are present all night as air freight shipments from all over the world arrive almost hourly. Around 7, there may be between 50 and 100 florists scrambling for service. They come from all over Northern California. All over Northern California, since the San Francisco Flower Mart is one of the major wholesale flower markets in the nation. In periods of scarcity, however, especially in the winter months, the market resembles a fire sale in a bargain basement. There was once a time when corsages were a major sales item, but today they are a relic. It used to be gardenias were sold singly to young swains working to impress their dearly beloved. Happy drunks on their way to meet someone in the St. Francis Hotel afforded another market for single gardenias. Also in the days when women both wore hats and gloves downtown, they often stopped to embellish their costumes with a corsage of some sort. But today, even though the stands still stock a few specialty items, young ladies will stop and ask what kind of flower generates such a pungent odor. Perhaps the oldest joke among the flower sellers is the one about the woman who stops to ask, What kind of flower is that? That's a chrysanthemum. That's a chrysanthemum, ma ma'am. <laughs> That's a mouthful. Let's see if I can say that. <laughs> what kind of flower is that? That's a chrysanthemum, ma'am. How do you spell it? Ma'am, if I could spell it, I wouldn't be out here in the cold selling them. There is also a pat answer for the old ladies who ask what is wrong with their houseplants. Do you water them? Oh, yes. You're probably watering them too much. Or if the answer is not often, the vendor advises that more water would be beneficial. Because the streets of San Francisco are always stirred by brisk, cold breezes, Albert scarcely ever appears in casual clothes. A quick change in the weather, and the only people who don't understand what is happening are the tourists. Consequently, Albert wears clothing in layers that can be added to or taken off at a moment's notice. There is one item of apparel, though, that Albert cherishes. A carefully tied necktie. The weather in San Francisco is never very hot, never very cold except at night, which is why we can sell flowers on the streets in the first place. Everywhere else in this country, the outside weather is either too hot or too cold, and flowers either freeze or wilt. In Los Angeles, the flowers fade in no time, and they could freeze up solid in a Chicago winter. San Francisco sellers may freeze, but the flowers stay fresh and crisp, as long as they would in an ice chest. Not too long ago, during the period when the city was beautifying Market Street as well as Lower Powell, some of San Francisco's most famous architects were hired by the city to design flower stands. The results were pretty to look at, but the flower sellers revolted. The stands were made entirely of glass and round in shape. The vendors took one look and said selling flowers from such a contraption would be all but impossible since the heat generated by the sun beating on the plate glass would roast the delicate blooms before the morning was out. As Albert added, How can you sell flowers from an oven? I don't know. For all the inconvenience of trying to do business on the streets, Albert actually likes being in the outdoors. He tells me his father loved the open air also, so much so that when he came home at night, he would immediately open all the windows. He hated confinement of any, t any kind, and so does Albert. One day, <clears throat> excuse me, I asked Albert if he ever worried about catching cold, and he said, I can't afford to. And then, more seriously, he added, You don't catch cold standing in the open, a draft maybe, but I doubt that too. Albert has many times in the past threatened to give up the flower business and move to Hollywood, since he thinks he would be able to get more acting jobs if he really put his mind to it. But standing in his way is the thought that moving away from the city would be a disloyal act, a betrayal of real San Franciscans. He believes that living in San Francisco is not a right, but a privilege, a special dispensation, and that anyone who doesn't contribute something worthwhile to the city has no business taking up that space. If you are not a San Franciscan at heart, Albert believes the city rejects you, and sooner or later, you move away, subconsciously, without knowing why. He says the city pops you out, as would a touchy stomach reacting to poisoned food. Albert is sure the city is his best friend. 
Albert says that if he had a choice, he thinks he would rather be a full-time actor than anything else. But he well knows the perils of trying to depend on the tenuous life of the theater for a living. One day feast, the next famine. There are long periods of drought in between the big paydays. And Albert adds, you eat every day. During his undergraduate days at the University of San Francisco, he was active in amateur thea theatricals and got so enmeshed in the attractions and the challenges he was unable to give it up after graduation. Without so much as a letter of introduction, he trekked to Hollywood, found a cheap room, and began a routine of persistent and organized door pounding that was eventually to net him a few jobs. One of his early roles was that of a Greek waiter in the picture called The Will Rogers Story. When I first went to Hollywood, he says, I didn't know a theatrical agent from a hydrangea, but I did know William Saroyan. You know, Armenians United. Bill had just landed a job writing for movies. I figured he might be able to do me some good, and though it wasn't much, he did get me in to see some people, and pretty soon I wound up with a job. Small time stuff, but then you don't work for the biggies, the first rattle out of the box. I had a pretty rough time of it. Since his first film effort, however, he has appeared in more than 50 moving pictures and television films, including some of the episodes for the lineup TV series, The Streets of San Francisco, American Graffiti, Peggy Sue Got Married, and Tucker. A couple of years back, he worked in I Married an Axe Murderer. I like to create characters who are strictly offbeat. You might even say grotesque. I play anything from an art dealer to a garbage collector, and then some. He has always had a daydream that he could transform himself into either a gangster or a sheriff. He became indignant. I'm a great gangster. I can, as a gangster, I can't be beat. Albert believes firmly in his acting talents, stating categorically that he has a genius for it, and there are few practicing artists who can so completely transform themselves at will into any given part. When I act, the character is so real to me, I talk to him, and he answers me back. When Bill Soroyan used to hang around San Francisco, he told me he felt the same way about the characters in his stories. Sometimes when I get into a plot, I feel as though I had jumped into another skin. I have a feeling for characters, so much so I can become less of myself and more of the other person. But you gotta have compassion and humility. If you have those, you can become another person. But you gotta have compassion and humility to forget yourself. While he is an original, he is well aware originality is not all that is needed. In fact, originality might even be a hindrance, since in the entertainment business, taking chances is a great way to lose money. From our conversations together, I have gathered that more than anything else, gang gangsters aside, Albert would like to play the part of a Western hero. He sees himself as an offbeat sheriff, dressed in baggy pants, lugging a huge six-gun strapped to his 26-inch waist, with his five-foot, five-inch body topped with an oversized Stetson hat. He feels that such a figure would be hilarious, and I must confess, confess when I look at him with his swarthy skin, long nose, and huge eyes, it would. Because of his small size and unusual looks, he recently auditioned for a modeling job in an aviation ad in a national... Uh, in a national magazine. Uh, and then again, there's another, there's no more, there's more missing. This whole chapter had missing parts in it. I, where did it go? The lost words. Uh, something appear most convincing. When he laughs, which is often, his eyes roll up and down as though on window shades. I haven't seen Albert much lately since I moved to the North Bay, but I understand from other flower sellers he got married to a lady named Ada. After the opera, oh, Aida, Aida, a lady named Aida after the opera. Same pronunciation, different spelling. Now the family has grown by two daughters. Everyone who stops by the stand must wait while Albert whips out the latest pictures. But then, so far as I am concerned, Albert can talk all he likes about anything he chooses to discuss because at, without the likes of the Nalbandians, the Hugassians, and the Kamozis, San Francisco would become as grubby as Detroit. Even the fabulous views of San Francisco Bay from almost any hilltop would not substitute for the elegance and beauty the, the flower stands bring to the city by the Golden Gate. 
Aimless drifters may clutter the streets and the back alleys of the Tenderloin, yet somehow San Francisco, over time, ejects the undesirables, no matter what touchy-feely laws are passed to save them from themselves. This is one cheery note that many people along Powell and Market Streets consider the greatest civic blessing since the Mission Dolores was built. All right, so that is the end of the chapter on Albert Nalbandian and his flower stands and the flower stands of San Francisco, which is really fun. Thanks for joining me today. And for those of you who listened, I hope you enjoyed the story. I will be back again on Monday. I think I'm going to take the weekend off. So I'll be back again for more story time on Monday. And we're going to read about... Um, Oh, we'll find out what we're going to read about. We've got a chapter called San Francisco's Famous Hangtown Fry. And if I threw some sawdust on the floor, do you think we could call this upstairs joint a dive? So there could be, there's going to be a lot of fun moving forward. We're going to learn about Izzy Gomez. Izzy Gomez is the next chapter. And that will be Monday. Monday at 3 p.m. Pacific time. Um... Thank you, the marked Decremet Tortoise Blog, Jorge Cornejo. <laughs> Can we do a, a request for? Yeah, I would love to read something like Ender's Game, but I think I have to get permission for that to be able to do an audio book reading, right? Um, if there are any authors out there who want me to read their books. <laughs> I can do that here on Twitter. It'll be fun. Um, but right now, yeah, I'm reading my grandfather's books. It's a project that I've wanted to do for a long time. Um, I'm taking these recordings and putting them up on YouTube, and then I might also take the audio from these and turn them into a, uh, a podcast eventually. And who knows? I was talking with some science writer friends yesterday about the possibility of doing maybe some radio play reenactment type readings, which would be kind of fun to turn the books into like radio dramas with characters and voices. I don't know. It would be, a, it could be fun. It could be an ongoing project. And I appreciate that you spent a little bit of time with me. I hope you enjoyed the chapter and learned a little bit about San Francisco and my, my grandfather, the San Francisco bookseller, He's a, he was, so when he wrote the books, he was probably in his 70s or 80, 80s. I think he was in his 80s when he, late 70s? No. He was in his 80s. Yeah, because he died when he was in his 90s. Um, he was in his 80s when he wrote these books. <laughs> and so um, he was an old conservative curmudgeon. And so <laughs> it's great to be able to um, hear a bit of his mind that he maybe didn't share with his, um, you know, young granddaughter who did not come from a conservative frame of mind. Yeah, but it's pretty fun. We can have fun, everybody. I'll be back Monday at 3 p.m. here on Twitter. Live reading. If you miss a day, you, these will be posted on uh, YouTube as well on my Dr. Kiki channel. So I hope you have a wonderful weekend. I'm going to try and get the This Week in Science podcast episode out today. I'm almost done posting it. So um, that's my next job. And yes, happy Easter. It is Easter this weekend, except for it's the Roman Catholics. It's next weekend. Um, happy Easter. I hope that you all celebrate in a wonderful way and uh, have a great weekend. And I will see you next week. Thank you. Bye. See you soon. Bye.